Welcome everyone. Uh, we will get started in just a few minutes. Welcome, good afternoon. We'll get started uh, with our event in just a few minutes. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. My name is Martha, and I'm the program manager at the Urban Design Forum. We are delighted to be partnering with the New York City Department of Transportation to discuss the recent transformations along the Broadway corridor as part of their Broadway vision plan. In case you're new to the Urban Design Forum, we are an independent membership organization that, that mobilizes civic leaders to confront defining issues in the built environment. We empower professionals of diverse backgrounds, industries, and perspectives to shape a better future for all New Yorkers. We investigate complex challenges in the built environment, study alternative approaches from cities around the world, and advance progressive strategies to build a more democratic city. A big thanks for the continuing support of our fellows, board of directors, and director circle. Today's presentation is a part of our Streets Ahead initiative. Over the next year, the forum is exploring ways in which New York City can boldly transform city streets to create connected communities. When COVID-19 hit, we saw how our streets became sites to socialize, dine, exercise, protest, and play. Our city government responded nimbly to the crisis by piloting the Open Streets program, enabling restaurants, businesses, and people to reclaim street space from private vehicles. Over a year and a half has now passed and we're obviously still in a global pandemic, but today New York is fortunate to see rising vaccination rates along with rising subway ridership. Folks are excited to get back into the office, reconnect with family and friends uh, and even return to the, and even we saw the return of the New York City Marathon this past weekend. And last week we elected a new mayor and a majority new city council which all, mean, also, all means that the forum wants to start thinking about ways that we can make new uses on the streets more permanent. So over the coming months, uh, we're organizing nearly 50 Urban Design Forum fellows to dream up new visions for our streets across the lenses of climate, care, commerce, culture, and continuity, one year and eight years ahead. We're excited to share new visions and mobilizing ideas for New Yorkers and work with the next administration to shape more people-centered streets. As we organize case studies and render new possibilities, we also wanna hear from you. What people-centered streets should we be looking at? Who should we be speaking to next, both in New York City and abroad? 
Um, so feel free to plug in your ideas and your thoughts in the chat uh, during our conversation today. So today we're very excited to host this conversation about the future of an essential corridor in Manhattan. To many, Broadway is the spine of Manhattan, connecting many historic and changing neighborhoods together, from the Garment District to Soho to our theater district and more. And also for many, it is the gateway to New York. Uh, I know some of my first memories visiting New York as a child were looking down Broadway from Times Square in awe at the wonders of the city. And many, many share that experience as well. Beyond the many tourists it serves, Broadway also connects countless workers, students, art, artists, and more to, to different parts of the city. And when the pandemic hit, Broadway was hit as well. Uh, and as we've seen across the city, the pandemic has highlighted the dire need for more open space. Uh, and further, our recent climate events have also highlighted um, our needs for green infrastructure to keep our residents safe and our businesses afloat. So I'm really excited about this conversation today because we're in a moment where we can envision the future of our streets, including Broadway, in a big, bold way uh, to look towards that thriving, equitable city we know New York can be. Uh, and so that's what we're here to do today to learn about the Broadway vision plan, the deep thinking and thoughtful process that has gone into it so far, the su successes achieved so far, and the paths forward to continued implementation. We'll begin today with a presentation from both the Department of Transportation and the Garment District Alliance. We'll then be joined by a wonderful team of respondents who will share their thoughts and ideas for the future of Broadway. And then we'll open the floor to your questions. Throughout the day, I'll encourage you to put your questions in the Q&A box and we'll do our best to answer them throughout the day. So let's get started. Um, if I can welcome Emily and Jonathan to join me on screen, please. Welcome Emily and Jonathan. Um, so let me quickly introduce our two incredible speakers uh, and then I'll pass the reins over to you. Uh, so first up, um, Emily Wiedenhoff is the Director of Public Space at the New York City Department of Transportation. She works closely with community groups throughout the five boroughs to reimagine their streets as public space. She's focused on the role of the public realm in strengthening communities for over a decade, deeply involved in policy management and legislation, and is most recently leading the effort to create shared and seasonal streets in New York City. So welcome, Emily. Very excited to have you. Um, and Jonathan is the manager of streetscape and planning for the Garment District Alliance, working to improve the quality of life in a dense and vibrant Midtown neighborhood. He previously held roles at the MTA New York City Transit uh, and Alan M. Voorhees Transportation Center at Rutgers Center. So um, I wanna thank you both so much for joining us today. Um, we're excited and privileged um, to have you share um, your wonderful collaboration and, and progress on the Broadway Vision Plan. Um, so with that, um, I'm going to pass it over to you. Great. Thanks so much, Martha. I'm really excited to be here with everyone. Um, apologies, I am in my office, so I'm, I'm masked uh, during this presentation. Um, but really excited to, to speak about um, the Broadway Vision Plan. Um, this was uh, an effort that we started um, quite some time ago, kind of building off of the, the really phenomenal work um, back in 2009 with the Greenlight for Midtown effort, where um, uh, DOT took a really critical look at um, premier public spaces along the Broadway corridor and uh, made and carved out even more vibrant public spaces, um, jewels along the necklace of, of Broadway using the streets, which was um, just a really a phenomenal transformation at the time. And it created, you know, really global public spaces. Um, but as we kind of took a, another look at the corridor and looked at the future moving forward, um, it was also really important to acknowledge Broadway as a local corridor, a local street, and what that meant for the kind of rest of the blocks that weren't um, plazas and really still felt uh, mostly like separate streets um, that that really needed um, to be more integrated into the neighborhoods. Um, so we began an effort um, with Arup to really think and move kind of beyond the binary of the street is either open or closed, it's either a plaza or not, and really develop um, a, a much 
uh, greater kind of gradient of street designs and really rethinking um, the hardware of our streets to make it do more, to make it more flexible and, and more nimble, but also think about the hardware in context of the software as well. Um, you know, we know that um, transportation and the future of um, things like micromobility and energy are constantly evolving at a pace um, we don't necessarily kind of see um, the outcomes to. So how do we think about both the hardware and the software and allow for flexibility um, and, and management so that we can ultimately over time um, to continue to increase the value of our streets and get more out of these spaces. And so by taking this toolkit approach, really allowed us to think about the, the comprehensive corridor, um, but really in a way that was also locally responsive to development, to individual stakeholders, to individual neighborhoods. And so, um, what uh, kind of started out as a, a, um, a lack of being able to create a plaza in the Flatiron District um, way back in 2016 presented an opportunity now with this, um, you know, diversified tool set to create a shared street and still manage a space for um, limited local vehicular access, um, self-enforcing slow speeds, but also really transforming the environment and prioritizing uh, pedestrians and cyclists while doing so. And so it really unlocked more value and was able, we were able to get more out of the street. We were able to um, continue to push for um, protected cycling um, and more pedestrian infrastructure. We were able to close um, uh, additional uh, blocks of Broadway to vehicles and open them for people and create even more premier public space along the corridor. Um, but we were also kind of thinking critically about Broadway and um, its intersection with a lot of other really important transportation connections, whether it be bike, ped, bus. And so, for example, the opportunity of the um, 14th Street busway uh, really helped us uh, carve out um, and strategize to create an even more expansive public realm. So a problem of how to get vehicles to turn off the corridor um, to prioritize buses created an opportunity for um, a shared street with more uh, bicycle and, and pedestrian infrastructure. Um, in a way that really reinforces a lot of these public realm designs um, uh, don't need to be mutually exclusive with building out really solid um, transit and, and transportation infrastructure. And all of this, um, all, all of this work was really uh, reinforced uh, with the, uh, the onset of the pandemic when we saw a, a massive um, need uh, to use our streets uh, differently, but also um, you know, a, a groundswell of New Yorkers embracing their streets as public space more than ever, um, you know, in kind of the most um, encouraging ways possible. And so as, um, you know, as we think through um, the, the kind of next set and the future of the street, we were really able to, over the past um, 18 months or so, uh, hit the fast forward button and really do a lot of um, fantastic innovating, um, you know, more rebalancing, thinking more about how we need to be relying on other uh, forms of, of service uh, and, and, and transit in our streets. Um, and with that, I'm going to turn it over to Jonathan to really zoom in and talk about kind of the, the transformation of Broadway um, and, the, and the transition of of the pandemic um, at the local level in the garment district. Thank you, Emily. And um, thank you to your team at DOT for, for working with us um, for this, this great project, which we're really excited to have. Um, and I'm excited to share a little bit uh, more about it with everybody now. So uh, first, I want to kind of orient everybody a little bit. I'm sure there's there's some folks on um, who are not from New York City, and uh, maybe even plenty who are who are still not familiar uh, with our neighborhood. We're sort of uh, seem to be the forgotten neighborhood of Midtown. Uh, so this is the Garment District, and as you can see, we're sort of surrounded by all the famous places that you've heard of 
uh, but encompass none of them, uh, save of course for the Port Authority bus terminal, which hopefully will be getting an upgrade of its own in the coming years. Um, and, and so these are the five blocks of Broadway in, in the garment district. Uh, the left side of your screen is to the north. And in 2008, um, we got our first plazas on Broadway. And it's, it's a little hard to see in this image, but uh, basically two travel lanes were uh, converted into pedestrian space. And for our neighborhood, this has been really important as, as this, is, this is what Emily showed of how we kind of fit into the overall puzzle on Broadway. Um, but for us, it's extremely important to have this space. And, and this map kind of shows why. So if you're not in the sort of Northeast corner of the garment district, there's virtually no open space. There's one building that has a privately owned public space, but then Broadway is it. It is our public space. We don't have a park, um, so Broadway is it for us. And so uh, it's really the centerpiece of our neighborhood and of our efforts as a business improvement district. And it has always been a vibrant space since it got implemented. Uh, if, for people who wanna go sit outside and eat lunch, like it is the place to be. And so we put a lot of effort into, um, in, into keeping it looking nice. Uh, and, and, and a lot of that is, is because of our, our great staff here. Um, it's a massive effort uh, maintaining plazas. And, and that's something that, that's probably worth talking about a, a little bit later in the session, um, is that the, the sanitation effort uh, that goes into keeping the plazas looking nice and the horticulture trees and planters and, you know, is, is major. Uh, and we're very fortunate because we are one of the largest business improvement districts in New York City. So we have a, a significant budget that allows us to maintain this space, but that's certainly not the case for all bids. And then uh, not to mention, of course, neighborhoods that don't have a bid at all. So uh, there's a, a larger conversation, I think, to be had about, about these spaces and how they can be provided across the city. But for us, uh, given our resources, we we're able to do a lot of programming on Broadway. And so this is something that we've been evolving over the last 10 plus years, uh, kind of building up to today in this new project. Uh, we have a, a constant um, ongoing art, uh, and sometimes even we get a little experimental. This was a dog park that accompanied a, uh, a dog uh, sculpture installation. Uh, and we always try, try to keep something going on in the space to keep it lively. Uh, illuminated, interactive installation, installations are some of our favorites. Uh, but to lead into to what we've just done, uh, back in 2017, we did our first seasonal street. And so this was the first time that uh, a block of Broadway had been closed to vehicles temporarily. And uh, it was, uh, as you can imagine, uh, a little controversial at the time. No one was sure quite how it was going to go. And you also will not be surprised to hear that it was a massive success. And we continued to do it. So we did uh, seasonal streets in the summer for three years in a row, 2017, 2018, 2019. Uh, and each year involved uh, a mural on the street and some other installations, um, uh, some uh, turf here, as you can see. Uh, and it was always a major hit, a massive hit uh, with the public, um, for the most part with the businesses surrounding. Uh, but there was also this sort of, and we were sort of doing this in part to do it as an event in itself, but also to um, kind of keep teasing at this idea that Broadway could be something a little different than, than what it is today or what it was then. Uh, so even still, uh, we would do this in the summer and you know, summer's always busy, it's popular, there's lots of tourists, everybody wants to be outside, but there was still some sense from a lot of people of, well, this makes sense for summer, but um, you know, would you want it in the winter? Uh, so then, uh, just before the pandemic, we had probably, I, I would love to top, to top this someday, but I don't think we'll ever top uh, this installation, which just was um, an incredible hit. We had these 10 uh, interactive um, illuminated seesaws. They make music and the lights change as you ride them. 
And it just was the crowds basically never stopped from early morning until night. And people loved it. And so we really started to get a sense that, well, even in winter, you know, that's not going to deter people from using the streets if they're programmed appropriately. So uh, when we were doing these installations, we we also wanted to find out, you know, what does the public think uh, about this? So we did an intercept survey on Broadway. This was in the summer, uh, not for the winter one. Uh, we intercepted a thousand people on Broadway in the garment district, and we asked them a series of questions, but I'm gonna show you some of the most important results. So the first, the first thing we found is that a lot of, if you live or work in this neighborhood, most people who do are using the plazas. And that goes back to what I said before. It's just, it is, it is the open space that we have. But what really excited us is that overwhelmingly people said that they like seeing blocks pedestrianized in some sense, either they said they would like to see it in the summer and, or they would like to see it all year long. And so, you know, in some ways, this was the way we asked the question. And this was also prior to the winter uh, seasonal streets that we did. Uh, but when we did this survey two years apart, there was a growing appetite for not just seeing it pedestrianized in summer, but all year long. And more interestingly, when you narrowed down the respondents to people who worked on Broadway, it was even more overwhelming. Uh, so the appetite was just huge from Broadway itself. So, I mean, you, you know, you can't get 89% of people to agree on, on just about anything. So all of these things, uh, the seasonal streets and the surveys are sort of, you know, we were slowly building this case for what Emily and her team were going to eventually bring to us, uh, which was a proposal to uh, enhance our plazas and, and turn one block into a full pedestrianized space. So this was the proposal DOT came to us with. We started this process before the pandemic. The pandemic happened, uh, slowed it down, but we kept going. Um, and, and, when, and when COVID happened, it, it sort of, um, I think it strengthened the argument. Uh, there was some, you know, there was a counter argument from some people of like, oh, the, the amount of pedestrians in the neighborhood has reduced so much. Why do we need this now? But I think that was way outweighed by, um, by people, and, and in particular, I'm talking about our board, which is mainly made up of property owners, who recognize that with work from home um, you know, becoming a well-established thing and, and it, it being unknown how many people will return to the office or how many will return only part-time, that people are really looking for amenities when they're here and that this could be an amenity. So, we had a lot of support overall for this from our board. Um, I would say that over the last 10 years, there's been a shift in the conversation and the way people feel about these things. Um, and it, it was not that controversial, save for, uh, as you know, Emily could probably attest, there are a couple of building owners who did have concerns and um, DOT had to, to work with them quite closely um, you know, one had a parking garage in their building that was not on the block that was going to be closed to vehicles, but they felt that maybe their parking garage would become a little less attractive. Um, and then another building owner who simply believes that everyone drives here, which is a um, very interesting perspective from a building owner in Midtown Manhattan. Uh, but generally, there was a lot of support and we worked very hard behind the scenes to get everyone on board with this. And we were very excited uh, that it moved forward. And this is what it looks like today. Uh, or well, the one on the right is what it looks like today. The one on the left was actually an interim treatment. Uh, prior to DOT completing the space, we were able to do a, a final uh, road mural, which was uh, fantastic. Uh, and uh, very well received, unsurprisingly. People love this stuff. Uh, and this is just yesterday. Uh, we just planted some new trees. Uh, and the spaces, as you can see, it was, um, you know, it was very nice yesterday. It was a little chilly, but that didn't stop people from filling up basically every seat we had. We're going to need to uh, expand our table and chair selection now. So it, it's, it's really, um, it took, you know, basically immediately. The space opened and it filled up. 
there's a huge appetite for this. I think more so now with, you know, a lot of people are, would still prefer to eat outside and they're going to do that as long as the temperature is still comfortable. So this space is, is just, it's really great. And we're really excited about it. And we, we think it's uh, perfect timing as people return to the neighborhood and return to their offices. And the final thing I will just briefly mention is long-term, we are still, you know, I think what DOT has been able to do in the last 10 to 15 years of using temporary materials to very quickly roll out projects has been amazing. It's allowed these sort of transformations to happen all over the city. Um, but we still have to get long term, we have to get our city capital process improved. It's way too slow, it's way too costly. Uh, this is from uh, DOT and Arup's uh, vision of what, uh, what the space could look like with a capital project completed, which there was some money put in the city budget for. And um, it, you know, as great as what's there today is, we, you know, it's, there's, it's low lighting conditions out there. There's very poor drainage. We have no power, which makes it hard when we do art installations, holiday lighting, et cetera. So we're really excited for a day when, when, when it can look like this and when these sort of capital projects can be rolled out faster across the city. Um, so with that, I will turn it back over to Emily. Beautiful. Thank you so much, Jonathan. Um, with our increasing challenges um, from growth to aging infrastructure um, to, to climate, um, it really creates uh, this tension between the demand for massive solutions um, while also being sensitive and responsive to real-time local needs like Jonathan spoke about. And so, um, you know, while we wait for kind of long-term investment, um, development, and better tools that will contribute um, to a better public realm for us all, um, and as we continue to calibrate our management tools um, within the context of long-standing uh, systemic inequities, and as we lumber through uh, the undulating landscape uh, of varying types of risk, whether it be speculative or uh, what's in front of us on a daily basis, um, the Broadway vision uh, really delivers people-centered streets uh, that are safer, safer uh, and more adaptable to an uncertain future, while also placing value on larger connections um, and the communities um, at the corridor and district scale. And so as we advance uh, programs like Open Streets moving forward, we really see that as a tool for, for public engagement to address and, and discuss these types of improvements um, throughout the entire city. Um, and you know, fundamentally, partnership uh, with local stakeholders um, and neighborhoods is key both to continue to foster innovation, but also um, really to allow um, you know, a, a flexible adaptation of these tools to neighborhoods um, and, and, and translating them to the different issues we see citywide. And so our hope um, with this effort uh, is that it really contributes to a scale and a piece of work that starts to allow us to embrace this tension between our short-term and long-term needs and allows us to live our best life while we are also actively tackling the next set of challenges. Thank you. Thank you, Emily, and thank you, Jonathan. And, and Emily, if you don't mind actually staying on screen with us, um, just really appreciative um, to both of you um, for sharing sharing your partnership and, and the really uh, amazing and, and thoughtful and beautiful progress um, you've made in the Garment District. Um, so we've, we've got a lot to dig into for what we've heard so far. Um, I wanted to start with a couple of questions um, for the two of you before we invite our respondents on to, to dig a little bit more deeply into the, the details. Uh, and I also just wanted to um, invite our audience again um, to, uh, to plug your questions into the chat. I see we have many 
uh, forum fellows joining us today. So um, our, our lively members love to ask questions. So encouraging everyone to share your questions in the chat and I'll do my best to um, incorporate them into the conversation um, as we move forward today. So Emily, I, I wanted to start with you. Um, and you mentioned, you know, moving towards this toolkit approach and, and I'm really, really fascinated and, and compelled by um, um, the approach here. And I wanted to dive a little bit more into that approach that you're taking on at DOT. And I'm, I'm thinking about the balance of, um, of honoring specific distinct neighborhood identities while also putting forth a cohesive vision for Broadway, for the Broadway corridor. Um, I'm curious about how you thought about those, that balancing act while you were developing the toolkit um, to, to honor really both of those needs. Yeah, it's a, it's a great question um, and something we were, you know, specifically grappling with um, along the Broadway corridor with the five different bids. And certainly it helped us to have, um, again, just really uh, five really phenomenal partners who were really willing to really kind of workshop with us um, and really build consensus around both contributing to um, a larger plan, but also um, working to meet the individual constraints um, and challenges within their own neighborhoods. Um, you know, I think we pretty consistently, particularly like in the transportation field, face the challenge of the the bid boundaries don't never don't necessarily overlap with you know what the project needs to be from um, you know really meeting kind of connection and um, transportation and and safety goals um, and so that's always something we're trying to to um, to work out and so I think part of how we think about the toolkit um, is that it allows us to makes quick gains in some places where we have support that will help really start to build and change culture and use and habits that will then um, help make um, other bolder, more incremental changes in some of the other more, more challenging areas. I think also the toolkit allows us to um, design and implement a better public realm um, with varying different maintenance, um, management, and capacity needs. And so we see something like a plaza, as Jonathan referenced, is just a, a tremendous amount of time and management and, and investment to really make sure that um, the, the public space remains successful. Whereas if we can start to shape the curb lane and just have a little bit of public realm amenities while also you know, making a better infrastructure for cyclists and safer crossings for pedestrians. Again, that can overall create a public realm, but not necessarily place a huge burden on um, a, a maintenance partner and gives us something a little more off the shelf while also still moving towards a kind of better on the ground um, outcome from a lot of different perspectives. So um, so that, that, that gradient is also really um, important as, uh, um, as a pushing for a, for a better outcome, despite challenges, whether it be, um, you know, people who oppose change or people who um, struggle to have the capacity to maintain. Thanks, Emily. Yeah, and so much, so much nuance there to, to um, to work through, it sounds like you really were, we're taking a, um, taking a really engaged approach. Um, Jonathan, I'm, I'm curious, you know, you as a business improvement district, you know, you're tasked with representing your, your local businesses. Um, how did you approach bringing your constituents into the, um, into the process of, of designing the spaces in the garment district and, and, um, really kind of making sure that the neighborhood identity, um, of the garment district, um, really shown in these public spaces? Yeah, I mean, fortunately, we were able to sort of get a head start on this, whether uh, intentionally or, or not, um, with, with our seasonal streets. So this is sort of a conversation we've been having um, with our board and all the businesses in the neighborhood for a long time, really. I mean, really five years now that we've kind of been teasing towards this. Um, and, and often our our art installations that we do are, are very uh, tied to the neighborhood. Um, when we solicit artists, uh, a, a lot of them 
you know, tailor their proposals to toward fashion, you know, or something very specific to this neighborhood because they find that interesting. So we've always been able to kind of maintain that identity. And in our, you know, our pitch with with this project was this will allow us to to do that more. I mean, it really opens up. In addition to obviously being a very valuable public space, it it's going to allow us better programming um, to have this much larger space um, that that we can use. I, I think it opens up a lot more possibilities. And 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 that you know some of these things are controversial. Pedestrianizing spaces are controversial, but the art has never been a controversial here. Everybody loves that. It's like always a hit, um, always a feel good. I don't think I've ever seen a negative uh, about it. Uh, so we use that a lot in kind of driving this process forward. Uh, and then, you know, once we really started getting into it with Emily and her team a few years ago, it was just, you know, we really just kept everyone in the loop uh, and, and kind of held their hand through that the whole way. Um, there was no way when this was, when this was said and done that, that anyone could say they didn't know um or that nobody listened uh or, or that emily and her team did not try to the extent possible to accommodate input uh beyond input that was just don't do anything yeah that's that's great to hear hear more about and and to um recognize that you know this has been a process that you began as you mentioned in 2017 um and that that really kind of building building um the neighborhood identity has been has been work you've you've been working on for a while, um, Emily. I wanted to wanted to um, go back to something you said a little bit. How you eloquently framed you know thinking about both software and hardware as we're designing our streets. Um, I'm wondering if you could tell us a little bit more about how you thought about the interplay between those two necessary elements. Particularly, maybe we can use the the garment district streets as an example um, of how you how you kind of teased out the interplay. Um, in those spaces specifically. Yeah, I think um, one big, um, I, I would say kind of very active layer that we're watching along Broadway and, and particularly in the garment district is um, how cyclists use the streets, how cyclists use shared streets. Um, and I think thinking through, um, you know, cycling has grown in the city um, over many years, but certainly during the pandemic, um, we see an ever increasing amount of micro mobility and kind of, you know, talk about a, a gradient of streetscape, we have a whole gradient of uh, micro mobility and motorized uh, vehicles um, using our streets. And so they're also a really important layer to be thinking about in terms of um, safety, but also an, an acknowledgement that it's a changing um, landscape and how much do we try to um, design in how we want them to behave versus, um, you know, how do we start to just be, you know, looking at the trends and how, what the demand is and how people are using the streets and start to, um, you know, make sure that our hardware accommodates for, for the, the software demand. Um, so, you know, definitely we are thinking about, um, you know, the, the width and usage of, of the streets for, for cycling, right? More cyclists means we need to start having, uh, allowing for overtaking and having fast and, and slow lanes. And so one of the benefits of the shared street design is while we still have um, a, a bike lane marked, the entirety of the roadway is still a space um, for slow speeds, for sharing, um, for, for cyclists. And we hope to see that kind of um, evolve and can, kind of move away from um, very specific markings of bikes and vehicles and, and start to have a more shared space design. And then, you know, another big question um, at, uh, um, and, and kind of next step for us is directionality and starting to think of, you know, one way versus two way. Um, and especially in the garment district where we have this demand for, um, you know, access to bike parking and the bike share dock and to very well used crosstown bike, bike lanes, um, you know, really watching how the, the, the software demand um, is kind of um, uh, uh, requiring uh, more from, 
from our hardware. Um, and again, this is one of those things where it's, um, we are making real time progress on the ground through the paint and gravel, but um, we will be, you know, really actively monitoring it and watching it. So when we get to that stage of investing the millions to build it out permanently, hopefully we will have a much more responsive hardware um, to um, to the conditions that are on the street with the software. Thanks, Emily, and really appreciating um, the the ways that you're uh, imagining that that our shared spaces are, are going to need to become more flexible and adaptable, and um, to really really accommodate a, a range of uses. Um, we're going to open it up in in just a minute um, to bring in our our respondents as well. But Jonathan, just wanted to um, get your your perspective a little bit first on um, the role of um, programming in the public space. Um, knowing that that programming can often be kind of what uh, what really uh, makes a public space really really great. Um, how how are you thinking about about the garment district spaces in particular, um, making them lively and active? Um, as you mentioned, you know your your board is really in, in support of um, of thinking about these spaces as as destinations. Um, and so what 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 is at the forefront of your mind um, when it comes to programming right now? Yeah, well, there's always a sort of an internal debate about about how to program the spaces, how to lay them out, uh, and and I guess the so the downside. So I, I talked about uh, the importance, I, I think, of capital construction and getting a permanent design with you know trees and things there. Uh, but, but the upside to what we've had now is that we can move things around uh, basically whenever we want. Uh, you bring in a forklift and move some planners and reconfigure it. So we've done a lot of experimentation um, of sort of, you know, do you go for like the English garden look or is it more piazza? And, uh, and right now it's more the, the, the piazza, the big open space, which seems to be working really well. Um, uh, so horticulture is, is, is a big part of this. And we actually just, um, just two days ago planted um, 23 new trees in large planters on the plaza. Uh, and there's not a lot of, of tree canopy in this neighborhood at all. So that's really important. We really want people when they when they get to Broadway to, to feel like they're in like sort of an urban oasis. Um, uh, but but the art is really, um, I, I think we Broadway is a, is an interesting place to do public art because it's 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 a, it's in shadow um, most of the day. There's tall buildings, lights everywhere. There's cars and uh, you know honking and people everywhere, uh, so there's a lot competing for attention. Um, so it, it we it, things have to really stand out in the space, uh, and the new the new full plaza is going to I think allow us to do some larger installations, which I'm excited about. Uh, and then they also have to be able to handle a space that sees you know tens of thousands of pedestrians flowing through. Uh, they have to be able to hold up to to, uh, you know, people are going to, whatever you could think of, someone might try to do, they're going to do it. They're going to climb on it. Uh, so it's, it, it can be tricky, um, but so far we've only had success. Great. Thanks, Jonathan. And, and excited to get more into, as you mentioned, the, the questions about maintenance and um, lots of, lot to dig into um, there as well. And, and hopefully we'll, we'll get there a little bit later. Um, first, I, I wanted to uh, welcome our two respondents onto the screen. So Melissa and, and Jeff, if you wouldn't mind uh, turning on your cameras. Um, so I'd like to welcome um, Jeffrey Schumacher and Melissa Howe as our respondents today. Um, I'm just going to briefly uh, introduce them and then um, we'll dive into, dive into some conversations. So, um, Jeffrey Schumacher has been working at the intersection of architecture, urban design, and planning for more than 25 years in both the public and private sectors uh, and in cities across the globe. Uh, he served as the city of New York. He served the city of New York as its chief urban designer and held lead leadership roles in some of the world's top architecture, urban planning, and design firms. Um, he also recently started an Instagram feed called Microurbanism, uh, which will include examples of small-scale urban design around the world. Um, 
And Melissa Howe uh, is an associate at Matthews Nielsen Landscape Architects, who has practiced professionally within the landscape and architecture fields in New York and Los Angeles prior to joining the firm in 2015. Within the studio, she leads projects that span across multiple scales and typologies, including parks, streetscapes, urban plazas, multifamily family residential, and large-scale waterfront developments. Uh, her work emphasizes the transformative impact that thoughtful design, placemaking, and sustainability can have on the built environment and those that who, who inhabit it. So welcome to Melissa and Jeff. Um, you both bring great experience, ex expertise and experience to this conversation in citywide urban design and, and planning um, and in the way we think about designing and planning our landscapes. Um, so I'm really glad to have you both um, to dig into some of the details about Broadway um, and, and think about you know, what might be possible for the rest of our city as well. So Jeff, maybe we can start with you. Um, you've led countless urban design and planning projects in New York. So it'd be great to, to hear your perspective um, what parts of the of, um, Broadway vision plan and installations resonated with you the most? Um, and what do you see as some opportunities to build upon um, or potential challenges uh, you foresee in advancing this vision? Uh, yeah, thanks. Thanks, Martha. And thanks for the forum for inviting me to, to be here. Uh, great act to follow. Um, I've been a fan of Emily since we worked together in the urban design office uh, years ago. And Jonathan, what you are doing in the garment district is just phenomenal. I mean, it really is putting the district on the map. Uh, so, so kudos. Um, yeah, so I mean, I, you know, I think you know, it's, it's, it's exciting for me to see that Broadway continues to be the testing ground for street transformation. You know, it's kind of like in, in, in a highly visible way, what you do on Broadway, you know, resonates not just around the city of New York, but around the world, you know, and certainly starting with Times Square and the transformation that ha happened there. So, you know, I think it's, it's great to see that. Um, you know, I was, I was doing a little bit of uh, history research before this call and, and learned that Broadway is, is uh, actually extends all the way up through Westchester County, like all the way up to Sleepy Hollow, which I did not know, but there's 15 miles of it that runs through the city of New York. Um, and, you know, I know the focus, at least of, of the slides that you've shown, and of course, today's uh, with Jonathan on the Garment District, but I think one question I would have is, is you know, what about the, the rest of Broadway? You know, what, what do we, what can we do when we don't have, uh, you know, the, the bids that are well-funded like we have in, in Midtown? Um, you know, I think one of, the, one of the great things that, you know, in, in Broadway as this testing ground is that you can do it in this sort of incremental way as you've done, you know, testing it out. Okay, try a bike lane here, see if it works. If it doesn't work, we move it. Okay, maybe we'll have more trees in this block. You know, and I think that that's something that's really nice about it because each neighborhood that Broadway runs through is unique, you know, and, and sort of, uh, you know, requires a different approach. But is there, I mean, going back to Martha's first question, you know, is there some sort of overarching vision of Broadway that I know some have, have called for uh, in the past. And then maybe to Jonathan, you know, I think that there, there's something, for me, there's always something really exciting about the temporary plaza versus the permanent, uh, you know? And I think even, you know, and again, going back to Times Square, even just seeing the lawn chairs, you know, that were put into, into Times Square. I mean, it was, it was obviously quite provocative and it was the first time that people really thought about streets, I think, in a serious way as public space, and at least in a very long time. And then for me, something kind of got lost when it became permanent, you know, and, and, you know, I think that puts a lot more pressure on, you know, the Times Square Alliance and Tim Tompkins to really program it and make sure that all the, the excitement is happening on the surface, you know, that maybe it's not the, the, the street mural on the asphalt that, that kind of brings, brings the color and life into it. But so, I mean, long-winded uh, way of asking, so how do you make sure that, I guess, the, the kind of ephemeral qualities of the temporary treatments that you've had in garment, the, the garment center, how, how does that continue uh, when it becomes a permanent uh, transformation? You wanna go first, Emily? For me to go for it. All right, I'll, I'll start. Um, uh, well, no, that's a good point. Now I'm sitting here in the 
the gears are turning in my head and I'm thinking, hmm, maybe we maybe we need to slow down that capital project. Um, and, and well, and you did hit on something. We are um, notorious here for changing our mind on what we want, um, which is something that we'll need to, to fix before a capital project. But I, I mean, the capital planning process is very long, uh, too long as I just complained about. Um, but I, I do think, it, I mean, it, that's the time when it will be critical to make sure that, that we get a space that is, um, uh, that I think has a good balance of, of, of permanent infrastructure, but also programmable space, uh, you know, a big, you know, open space that we can do with what we want, but that we have power and we don't have two feet of water ponding at the corners every time it rains etc um uh, but it is it is something that that i i hear sometimes from from business owners and, and just people on the street that it feels like it feels like it could be taken away at any time which you know theoretically it could um I, realistically i don't think so um so that's kind of why we we really want to see capital and we think it would just be nicer, but but you're right. I mean, it's important to make sure that the final product, which is going to be there for decades, is is what we want and is something that we can continue to make kind of a living space that's always changing. Because that's one thing I think people that work here like they really like about the plazas and like our arts program is that there's always just something different. You know, you come into work one day and there's something. Oh, what happened over the weekend? Like there's a giant thing there now there's seesaws now so i we would never want to lose that um it's one of the most valuable parts of what we do so we would yeah we would really focus on making sure that a, a capital project would would allow us to continue all of that programming yeah and uh, um I, I think really great points and questions jeff um you know it's certainly it's easy for like um uh, DOT and my team who are working citywide to always be able to just like jump to the next fun thing. But I think one of the really big challenges with public space is it's not like, you know, a kid where, you know, you, you change its diapers and feed it and it eventually grows up and it'll take care of you when you're old. It is more like a pet where you have to continually like feed it and, you know, clean up after, um, after it for its entire life. And so there is something so much less glamorous kind of once the space, um, you know, really settles in and becomes permanent um, and it kind of loses, loses that excitement. And that's where the kind of the, the, the partnership and, and keeping these spaces relevant is so critical because that also, you know, keeps investment in all of the stuff we don't like to talk about, which is the maintenance and the management and the regulation and enforcement, and, you know, all that, um, all that stuff that um, is so key to long-term healthy public spaces. Um, and so I think, you know, kind of linking that problem and that challenge back to Broadway and your earlier question about like, what is the larger vision? I think um, for us, the, the kind of big transportation move is to be thinking about these um, large scale corridors and districts throughout the city, not just in Manhattan, that are bike and ped priority, um, that really can serve um, and be um, a very kind of a, a adaptable space, um, despite whatever happens, you know, another global pandemic, you know, every neighborhood has a bike ped street that if there aren't many vehicles and vehicles are driving super fast, they know there's like a route that they they can walk on. Businesses know that there is is space for them to, you know, borrow or utilize. Or um, we have this this kind of flexible, safe space. Um, and so the while we kind of chart out exactly what that means on Broadway, like the larger trends were kind of set with. Um, back in, in Greenlight for Midtown, you know, we had um, 
um, uh, almost 2,000 vehicles in the peak hour on Broadway, you know, post closing Times Square, we were down to the hundreds and we continue to get lower and lower. Um, and in the Flatiron, for example, um, you know, 22nd to 23rd Street, we have 18 times more people using the street than vehicles. So that's where, you know, the huge culture shift is now like allowing us to just think about what is a bike ped priority corridor that runs through the entire city, so many districts, things like that. Um, and it's also the challenge that, um, uh, that, that Open Streets has provided. And so we have these other great uh, coalitions and groups that have popped up across the city to advocate for the same kind of caliber of a Broadway bike ped street in their neighborhood, 34th Avenue in Jackson Heights, Berry Street in North Brooklyn. Um, these are the kind of larger scale um, corridors that we're very excited to kind of work on and, and take on next. All of that is to say that like, you know, um, I think one way to start to think about um, how to keep these spaces relevant and active is ultimately at that larger scale. So if you think about, you know, programs like summer streets or, you know, other citywide events, like, is there a way we can start to use the bike ped priority corridors to really link together to advocate for improvements or celebrate, um, you know, certain, you um, uh, certain accomplishments, you know, just, uh, you know, Martha, you mentioned the the marathon, right? That's just such an amazing, incredibly exciting global event that like threads and links through our city. And so what if we start to think about all of these bike ped priority streets kind of at that scale, at that level of excitement, um, and what that means for investment um, and what that means for bringing investment to other parts of the city and not just the same, um, you know, same couple neighborhoods or, you know, same set of blocks each year. Um, and so I think that, you know, that's one thing that I think we're very excited about and would like to continue to push and question and see, and, and maybe that might be a way to, to reinvigorate um, and make some of these more permanent, well-established spaces um, uh, kind of retain relevance and excitement. Thanks, Jeff, for your great questions, and, and Jonathan and Emily for, um, for diving in deep. Um, I want to turn it over to you, Melissa. So you bring such a great breadth of experience in landscape architecture and design. You know, you've led public space and streetscape projects that support climate resilient neighborhoods. I'd love to hear what parts of this plan resonate with you and, and um, either questions you have for Emily and Jonathan or um, your perspective on, on how, um, how we can continue to build on the progress so far of this plan. Thank you so much, Martha. I'm so happy to be here with such a great group of people um, to hear about this vision plan that's quite ambitious. And I really think that I enjoy um, the way that you've thought about the continuity of space because that is so key and critical to the pedestrian experience as you move both north and south, but also as Emily mentioned, east and west. Um, there are very few crosstown pedestrian connections currently and very little public transit that serve those crosstown connections. So the future of a plan like this and how that can also be brought into those crosstown corridors is super important and super interesting um, as we think about the future. I also think that the idea of creating this hybrid, not fully closed, not fully open street is quite intriguing. Um, and wondering about the maintenance challenges that poses for the bids um, in terms of drivers understanding how to use these spaces, pedestrians understanding how to use these spaces. Um, some of those images that we saw from the garden district were quite interesting in terms of the different types of spaces that are created. But also underneath it all is, is of course the temporary surfacing of the plaza um, in the areas where there are no public asphalt art. So the legibility of those spaces is of interest to me um, and how we can make things a little more clearer to prevent accidents or any sort of safety issues that may arise. I also think the timing of this discussion is really interesting um, and curious to hear about what the, what the current stage of this vision plan is in. 
um, how much community outreach has been done and how much more will be done. Um, and you know, it's not just about spatial continuity in terms of a plan like this, it's also about the temporal continuity. So I'm interested to hear uh, what the final outcome or product of this plan will be and how it will help to guide uh, both now and in the future these different elements that are being shown and discussed that are so important to making a great public space. Um, I think that's that's really what I'm interested in hearing from you. So Emily and Jonathan, please yeah, respond. Yeah, I um I love your question about continuity, not just physically. Um, I think that is so important and something that is definitely on our minds. Um, and I'll say, like honestly, something that is challenging, kind of continuing to work on something for so long. Like Jonathan, I'm sure you can attest, like there have just been times like we've gone back to present to the community board and they're like, didn't we see this already? Or wait, didn't we, didn't we? do that survey already and you're coming again and you know so I think um how do you maintain a, a continuous dialogue um with community stakeholders throughout such a long process is, is is certainly a challenge and how do you try to overcome fatigue um also how do you and, and you know a part of our role um at the city we find is so important is how do we make sure we are amplifying the voices who don't necessarily have the microphone because particularly you know in the context of, of Broadway um, like as Jonathan pointed out the kind of user groups between um, property owners versus the people that are working or moving through the space um, you know is um, just so varied and so how do we make sure that that we really are amplifying and kind of giving a forum to to everyone um, so we can have a better sense of of needs and and demands um, and so I mean I don't necessarily have uh you know have have the best answer it's it's for us a definitely um a learning process um I think there's also an honest acknowledgement that you know uh myself and my team like we'll work on this for a while but this is you know this is a corridor that belongs to the city and to everyone and we anticipate it will be something that continues to be responsive to new york city for many many years to come i think a lot of our um, challenge and thinking is is translating um, these types of tools and treatments to um other neighborhoods outside of the the broadway corridor um, and particularly um thinking about what does bike and pedestrian infrastructure look like um, not in a commercial district uh, because one of the kind of great um developments over the pandemic has been again these um really vibrant residential um, bike and ped corridors um, and so yeah thinking through thinking through those those connections and, and really translating them. Um, so yeah, I don't know, Jonathan, if you want to jump in? Yeah, well, I can, I think I can add a little on, you know, you were asking about how the design is working out and sort of vehicular behavior and it is, and that's the value of, of starting in temporary materials. Um, I definitely kind of was holding my breath to see, you know, that first day in those first weeks, what was going to happen, uh, particularly with the, the the shared street, because I don't know, as we know, whatever uh, people driving in New York can take, they will take. Um, and I and I feel like I had seen some examples of shared streets that worked well, some that didn't work quite as well. So I was very curious how ours would work, and it's actually I, I think working just as intended and and there's a couple reasons i think for that from a design perspective one is that the um the shared street comes after the plaza block so and also i mean our, our corridor was particularly easy because broadway is a dead end to vehicles at 41st street it's a dead end to vehicles at 35th street so we were already only talking about six blocks that that vehicles could travel down continuously anyway uh, so there's already pretty low volumes, but by having the plot the block before the shared street, people turning on the only people driving onto the shared street are turning 
uh, from 39th Street, which usually is because they have some local destination there. Uh, and in fact, from my observations, it seems a lot of people see the, the surface, the different, you know, textured surface and keep driving because they're not sure they're supposed to be there, um, which from my perspective is just fine because the people who um, really need to be on that block know they're allowed to be there. So, uh, and we do see people uh, just walking on the shared street, um, you know, pretty, pretty uh, casually. Um, so I, I think uh, so far, knock on wood, it, it's functioning quite well, but I think it does, I think it depends on what is upstream of it um, from a traffic flow perspective. Uh, and then, you know, the, the first couple of weeks, there was a little bit of traffic jams north of the plaza block, um, but that kind of, you know, behavior adjusted, I think it got programmed into a lot of the, the GPS software, Google Maps, et cetera, which seems like most people use to tell them where to drive. So for a little while there, it was telling them drive down this block that you can't, and then they were getting there and being surprised. So once that all got ironed out, it seems to have been fine. And, and even, even the people who were um, naysayers before, uh, we haven't really heard from them. So that's always a good sign. Thanks, Melissa, and, and thanks, Emily and, and Jonathan. I want to, this is actually a, a, a perfect segue. I wanted to ask and to start to bring in um, some of the questions um, from our audience about, um, about traffic flow, recognizing, you know, our, we're seeing a vision where um, bike and pedestrians are prioritized and we're still living in the reality where vehicles need to get in for deliveries or, um, or drop-offs. Um, I'm curious how how you have been considering um, uh, the consequences of traffic diverting to other neighborhoods, um, and then also um, one of our fellows, Elise Wagner, is curious um, about uh, business deliveries and uh, how those are managed, um, especially on the full plaza blocks. Um, so either to Jonathan or to you, Emily, would love to hear more about that. Well, I'll start with the delivery piece and then I'll, I'll let Emily take the rest. Uh, so we did go business to business before this project to talk about how, how do they get deliveries and kind of let them know this might be coming and, and try to find out if there were any major issues that would be caused. Um, fortunately, in, in our case, um, on the plaza block, um, one of there was on one side of the street, there's no, um, they have a loading dock on the side street. So for them, they they did not mind at all. Um, and then the building on the other side of the street, the businesses said they typically unloaded on the side streets anyway, um, so that it it wouldn't necessarily change things. Not that they're happy about their current lo loading situation, which is always difficult here. The whole neighborhood is already commercial parking, but it's still um, still can be tough. Um, and then a lot of businesses like to use uh, legal illegal uh, 53 foot long trucks, which are not allowed on New York City streets, but they use them anyway. Uh, so I don't have as much sympathy for that, but so so far it's been okay. Um, Emily and her team did make some adjustments on the shared street um, to allow for a little bit more commercial loading space uh, in response to some feedback. And that seems to have helped. Yeah, and I, I would encourage everyone, um, if you haven't seen it, to take a look at DOT's recently released freight pr plan, um, because you know, as as a city, we're still heavily reliant on um, the, the delivery of our goods by trucks. Um, it's still at about ninety percent, um, and so we're certainly at a point where to get to the next level of public realm improvements, we need a lot of very kind of thoughtful um, strategies about um, freight and, and delivery management. Um, and again, everything from thinking about cargo bikes to more hub and spoke models to neighborhood delivery um, and off hour delivery strategies. Um, you know, and that's ultimately going to be key to doing more of these improvements kind of whole scale um, throughout throughout the city, wholesale throughout the city. Um, and, you know, certainly with um, all of our improvements, we take a big look at traffic impacts um, and really look at diversions and, um, and impacts to the larger network. I mean, as you might imagine, um, uh, Midtown Manhattan is challenging to, you know, specific, 
specifically in this area where you have a lot of of tunnel traffic um, and really peak hour demand. Um, I just I also think that's something that uh, is was such a powerful example during the pandemic of how we can actually think about management strategies for dealing with our transit peaks that can yield way better public realm outcomes um, for the city and hope that, you know, that continues to be something that people who want to see, you know, linear parks and more public realm um, on our streets are also, you know, really making those those really critical connections to all these other kind of management and policy layers that we need to be thinking about um, as we, yeah, as we kind of design uh, on the ground. And I'm sorry, Martha, was there another uh, I think, I think to your you question? Hit, okay. I think you hit the big ones. <laughs> I know, I know we're throwing a lot at you at once um, and, and really appreciating um, your reflections there. Um, Jonathan, I want to uh, make sure we we can touch on the the maintenance questions because I know I know that's that's a big um, a big challenge and opportunity, and I'm sure you're acutely aware of the amount of trash that's generated and disposed of in your neighborhood. Um, we've also had seen new calls for visionary ideas for trash management on the street through vision plans put forth by other bids across the city. Um, I'm curious how you're thinking about trash in these spaces. Is and and what your your kind of dream dream is uh, for a trash management? Yeah, I mean it is shocking. I, I've had a number of occasions where I have to be in the neighborhood, you know, overnight for an art installation at you know four a.m. or something like that. And and before our crews come in in the morning, um, the condition of the plazas and the streets around here is uh, truly shocking. And then um, by the time everybody starts coming in the morning, you would never know that because our, our guys have made it spotless. Um, but it is something that just you know requires just a lot of uh, a lot of work um, and, and a, a large budget to to keep to keep it in good shape. And not to mention the the horticultural element is one of the biggest uh, parts of our budget too. But yeah, on the trash point, I mean, we are, I think we as an organization, certainly me personally, I mean, it's, it's from a personal perspective, it's one of my favorite New York City topics to discuss is trash. Uh, I mean, we have not ourselves um, gotten involved in the, the pilot that is ongoing from sanitation now. We do uh, have some containers of our own that we use on Broadway for our trash before it's collected. Uh, but generally, we are really supportive of the idea of containerizing garbage. And it's long overdue. And there's many, many, many cities around the world we can look to to see how to do it successfully. So we're uh, we're all all for it, and we also hope uh, that the the private carding reforms that are uh, coming soon will also uh, help as well. Thanks, Jonathan. Um, so I know I know you mentioned that the the um, complicated work of maintaining the horticulture too. I thought this might be a, a nice place, Melissa, to hear a little bit from you about. Um, the kind of environmental and, and greening um, opportunities and challenges along Broadway. Um, I know you've led numerous green infrastructure projects and as a landscape architect, you're thinking about the relationship between our natural world and our built environment. Um, I also know there's a lot going on underneath Broadway. So we've got subway lines, utility lines, probably way more than I even know. Um, so Melissa, I'd love to hear, like, what do you think are the key challenges and opportunities in expanding green space in a commercial district um, like, like Broadway uh, from a landscape perspective? Sure, I think Jonathan's earlier remarks about the measures that the bid is taking, that the Garment District Alliance is taking to make the space feel more green and welcoming and inviting in terms of the new plantings that he's installed. Um, and the challenges also with the infrastructure below the street, you know, there's subway lines that go through the air. This is, um, Broadway is one of the corridors with the least tree cover, as he had mentioned. So I think that there is a lot of opportunity, particularly in the capital program. Um, when, when the plazas move from being temporary 
plazas to being capital projects to increase the amount of tree canopy, particularly because there is this encroachment of the extended sidewalk with into the roadway, which is beyond a lot of the infrastructural conflicts that we have. Um, so I think that I would encourage, you know, for the future to definitely include tree canopy cover as an integral part of the vision planning process um, and to each of these projects as they start. I think one thing that was actually quite interesting that Jeff brought up is the funness of the spaces. And um, Jonathan, you remarked upon the challenges as we move from the temporary plaza to the capital uh, permanent plaza. I think the, the need for durable materials and what that means is often a lot of the problem. Um, you know, there's a desire to spend money on things that will last, and those are typically very hard materials. Um, there's a need for making sure it's maintainable. And a lot of the fun aspects, like the temporary art, the paintings, um, the different activations can sometimes get lost in that because of maintenance. So I would encourage uh, you and all the other um, maintenance partners to really carefully consider how you can calibrate that and really, again, not lose that fun aspect. Because it's not just about um, allowing people to walk through. It's really about the comfort. It's about drawing people in. It's about making sure that they have a reason to use the space, quite honestly. Um, so I, I think that this actually represents a big opportunity to increase all those uh, elements that we would like to see in the spaces to make a more robust public realm. Thanks, Melissa. And, and um, I'm dreaming of, of tree canopy all along Broadway. It, it's a beautiful vision. <laughs> Um, I want to touch on, and Emily mentioned a little bit, the kind of the sticky questions we don't like to talk about, about enforcement and safety. And, and of course, it's the forum, so we're going to go there. Um, and I'd love to love to kind of hear actually from, from any of you um, this, this kind of question about balancing defensive architecture and ensuring safety in public spaces while also making them feel welcoming. Um, yeah, I think Emily or Jeff or really to anyone, how do you think we can consider balancing this need for providing safety for our users of the space while also making them feel um, feel welcome along Broadway? And maybe Jeff, I'll, I'll pass it to you first for your thoughts. Sure, yeah, I, I mean, I think, I think what's really exciting for me uh, is to see that DOT is really exploring the kind of shared street model you know and, and i think emily put it well that it doesn't it's not this sort of binary decision it doesn't have to be all or, or nothing when we talk about pedestrianization and i you know and certainly you know when you travel to european cities you know the shared street it kind of exists you know everywhere and there is a self-regulating quality to it um that you know Granted, <laughs> New York City is unique. Uh, you know, we have volumes of people and cars and everything else that other cities don't necessarily have. But, you know, I think the more we kind of allow these spaces to self-govern, um, rather than, you know, one thing that I hate to see is the bollards everywhere, you know, and it just, and I understand certain locations, you know, since 9-11 are, you know, potential targets. Et cetera, et cetera. But I, I do think we've taken it too far, um, you know. And 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 it's and you know you, you kind of there's a, you know you know talk about funness. You know you kind of you you lose something fun about a public space when all you see are these these elements that are meant to uh, you know keep out people. Um, so it's uh, you know I think as as much as we could design it in a way that it can self regulate uh, the better, but curious to hear what Emily had to say. Yeah, totally. I think funness, but also flexibility. You know, that was something that um, you know, we were super excited about the flexibility of shared streets. And then all of a sudden, um, kind of dealing with uh, uh, an approach of a very hard edge. Suddenly, if you have bollards lining you know, the, your entire shared street, it's not very flexible anymore. Um, and when we look at cost benefit and 
you know, doubling um, sometimes the cost of projects for for security infrastructure, um, which is, you know, also just a, a continually fluid and changing um, set of risks. Um, I do think it, it, it's one of the greatest challenges that we will be facing in New York for the next, um, you know, for, for the foreseeable future at this point is, you know, Jeff, to your point, like really trying to get to the right balance and not kind of going, going overboard. I think an idea that we would like to continue to push is that if we are creating these slow speed, these self-regulating slow speed corridors and districts, and we are limiting vehicle traffic, you know, can we be thinking about security at the larger scale if the threat is not able to come in or the threat is not able to get up to a certain speed ever, um, you know, can that be cause for, you know, rethinking, um, rethinking uh, still a, you know, smart and responsible, but more balanced um, security um, strategy for, for these types of of corridors and districts. Thanks, Emily, and, and thanks, Jeff, for um, really teasing out what uh, the just the the complicated balance here that we're 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 looking to. As Emily mentioned, this is going to be one of the big questions our city is facing, and and I'm sure Broad, Broadway is not alone in 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 facing these questions. Um, so we have we have about ten minutes left. I wanna I wanna turn a little bit to to thinking about process and and looking forward. Um, so first, and and Jeff, maybe I'll I'll turn this to you as well. Um, this is kind of a blend of a question of my own and and also a question from um, Dan Kaplan, who's a who's a fellow in our audience. He's posing this question. Um, having worked in both the public and private sectors. Jeff, I'm curious where you think there's more room to collaborate on projects like these or models that we might look towards um, to, to really continue to strengthen um, kind of the best from both public and private. And, and Dan's question in particular was, um, was really picking up from Jonathan's observations about the length of time that things take. Um, he's curious if there are any local um, or even not local models for the private sector or bids to actually construct permanent improvements. Um, so curious, curious your thoughts there, and, and um, of course, welcome others as well. Yeah, maybe uh, the the latter one uh, I'll I'll uh, answer later. But uh, actually, can you can you repeat the first question again? Sorry, I have a dog at my feet who's annoying <laughs> me right now. So sure. Yeah, so my first question um, was really, uh, where do you think there's more room for the public and private sectors to collaborate uh, yeah. on projects like these and any models yeah. that we might look towards? Yeah, yeah, I think um, uh, as I'm sure Emily will, 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 she probably is a member of many, the multi-agency task force. Uh, <laughs> we, we had many, and in fact, uh, under when Amanda Burden was, was commissioner, we had a task force that, focused on the security elements in the public realm, uh, including NYPD and the agencies involved. I don't think that task force exists any longer, but, you know, I mean, you know, as, as bureaucratic as it sounds, you know, I think as, as, as much as possible, we can get agencies to work together, um, you know, and, and sometimes it's forced, you know, and, and it's not to say that agencies don't want to work together. It's just everyone has their, their own purview. Everyone's incredibly busy. I mean, Emily and her team, you know, certainly with COVID, I mean, it's, you know, everyone is, is, has a lot to do. So, you know, I think as much as you can kind of build that in to the process um, uh, or, or make it um, part of the process, you know, that you really have to work across disciplines and across agencies, um, you know, I think, I think that would be something I would put forward for the new mayor to really kind of, you know, think seriously about, you know, in a way that I think is happening now at the federal level, um, you know, with now that we have this infrastructure bill, uh, I was hearing this morning that Pete Buttigieg is hiring. So hopefully we don't lose any of our talented folks from New York anymore. We've already lost a few, stay in New York. Uh, but, you know, it's, it's, you know, at the federal level, the different agencies working together, HUD working with EPA, you know, and, and so I think as much as, as we can uh, make that part of the process, uh, I think it's better, better for the long-term benefit of the city. Thanks, Jeff. And 
you actually touched on um, a piece that I, I want to, wanted to put to, um, to all of you, but especially Emily next and I'm curious your, your perspective on, um, you know, city agencies and, and collaboration. Um, we know that the, the collaboration between agencies, it, it can be a challenge, right? There's often some siloing that's happening in our city, um, but it's also so essential for these spaces to be successful. Um, what do you think, from your perspective, Emily, needs to happen to support um, even better interagency collaboration for spaces like Broadway? Yeah, I think it's a um, increasingly uh, critical question, um, and you know, Jeff, I think you you know uh, just as much as um, as me that yeah, I, I think you're exactly right. Like, it's not that agencies don't want to collaborate; um, it's ultimately that big is hard. New York City is huge, and especially for the operational agencies, sanitation, um, environmental protection, DOT, like there is so much work that they are doing to keep this city up and running that it makes some of these kind of larger uh, coordination layers just incredibly challenging. So I really do think, um, and again, at, at an exciting moment with a new administration, um, you know, it really is about the kind of administrative levels, um, you know, the, um, the leaders um, at the deputy mayor level, like really thinking strategically about how do we, you know, wrestle with um, the, these crazy operational challenges, but how do we help start to solve some of those issues by being more strategic and understanding, um, you know, all of these kind of key points of overlap between the different agencies that can ultimately yield better, better outcomes on the ground, because there are certainly problems that a lot of, um, you know, different, different agencies and parts of the city are facing that can be kind of um, more strategically aligned to help be doing more than one thing um, and and solving more more than one problem um, and that's certainly something we've seen kind of just zooming into um, some of our own work around equity with our plaza equity program um, which has kind of grown with um, the citywide cleanup core effort and we're really looking to expand uh, well into the future with open streets is how do we um, pair uh, the kind of need for high quality public space and under resourced neighborhoods with workforce development and, and job creation um, and local hiring and sounds great, but it's really hard. Um, but, you know, we have a lot of lessons learned and are really excited to kind of continue to, to move that into the future. And I think the public realm is the place where all of this comes together. And so the more we can be strategic about um, our decision making and our priority setting, um, the better outcomes we, we can have. Um, and I do think it's also um, incredibly important. And, you know, with this fantastic group of people that are, um, you know, part of the, the conversation today and all, you know, all of the great forum fellows, like it is um, a huge, um, it's a huge responsibility for advocates and for the leaders in the field to also acknowledge that, um, again, a lot of this takes a really sophisticated understanding of how to solve a lot of these on the ground challenges. Um, and we both need long term goals, but also like short term incremental solutions that can help just continue to push forward and move the bar for better outcomes for everybody. Thanks, Emily. Um, so we, we just have a, a few minutes left today. Uh, so I wanted to, to end our conversation today, actually looking, looking ahead to our, our new administration. Um, and I'd love to actually just hear, you know, a brief um, 30 seconds, quick, quick pitch from each of you. What, what is your one big hope for Broadway and for our streets in general that you would put forth to the new administration? And whoever, whoever can, would like to start. Um, Maybe I'll start with with a pitch that I think this audience will like. Uh, hire a lot of urban designers. You know, get lots of really talented urban designers in all the city agencies to help you to visualize and and synthesize and and sort of uh, you know take 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 the city where it needs to be. I'll jump in next. Um, I would pitch that there should be 
more of a voice for communities and neighborhoods um, in terms of what goes on in their in their areas um, more voice to them as well as perhaps some sort of new agency or uh, program wherein leaders from the community can actually effectively work on the public spaces that they have and not just through the community board process or any of the other more um, silent initiatives, but to have them as an actual stakeholder in the process. Well, I, I, I guess this is a common theme I keep hitting on, but um, I would encourage the new mayor to just uh, keep it going, but, but speed it up. And um, that may mean, you know, helping staff up uh, Emily and her coworkers teams a, a bit more, but we know what the solutions are generally. We know they work. Um, and we know that we need to make these changes all over the city. So I hope he, um, I hope he's aggressive. And Emily, any thoughts you have? Uh, just to reiterate that I think, you know, every neighborhood deserves a really high quality public space, and that is not always a design problem. Um, so to continue to push um, for, for these types of innovations that we've had the privilege to do on Broadway in other neighborhoods um, and make sure that they are truly kind of um, developed in um, in close coordination with communities. Um, quality over quantity uh, is is definitely our mantra. All right. Well, I want to thank all of our presenters, Emily and Jonathan, and our respondents, Jeff and Melissa, um, and our attendees and fellows for such terrific questions and for tuning in today. Uh, and of course, I would let, would be remiss to not thank my colleague Guillermo Gomez for his deft support with tech behind the scenes. Um, so to learn more about the Broadway Vision Plan, you can visit the New York City Department of Transportation's website. Um, and if you're an Urban Design Forum member, uh, we welcome you to join us this Friday, November 12th, um, for a walk down Broadway to see the three installation projects in action. Um, so please feel free to visit our website uh, or to RSVP uh, at rsvp at urbandesignforum.org. Um, I wanna thank again, our fellows, board of directors and our director's circle for their support. Uh, and please stay tuned uh, for more on our Streets Ahead initiative. If you have projects or plans that you would like to discuss, please feel free to reach out to us at the forum. Uh, and with that, I wanna thank everyone again for your time uh, and for uh, uh, discussing the Broadway Vision Plan today uh, and have a great afternoon. Thank you.